we're, uh, we're losing wetlands. Wetlands are a key thing. Now, here's an image uh, uh, of San, the San Francisco Bay Area. I like this one. This is a really cool map. Um, but uh, this is, so we're looking from inland out to the ocean. San Francisco's there on, on the peninsula. All that grit, mostly around the bay, all that gray stuff you see, that's mostly concrete. That concrete is mostly gone where there used to be wetlands. So in the lower 48 states, state uh, area of the US, we've lost about, and over, this is over about the last 150 odd years or so. We've lost just over half of all of the wetlands that used to exist 150 odd years ago. In California, you and I have the dubious distinction of having lost the greatest proportion of wetlands of any state. So 91% of our wetlands that used to exist 150 years ago are no longer in existence. The 9% that remain are mostly degraded, are mostly impacted, harmed, uh, uh, changed functioning, however you want to phrase that. So again, when we get into conversation with people, oh yeah, trying to save wetlands, screw you. I'm not trying to save wetlands, I'm trying to save the last of the wetlands. It's not an issue of going from 72% to 70%. If we lose more, we're talking going 9% to what, 5%? Gave you 91%, you're not gonna give me nine? That's the proper context to start the conversation. Louisiana, has, so California, the greatest proportional wetland loss. Louisiana, the greatest magnitude, grow absolute acreage of wetland loss. So we're going from the greatest proportion to the greatest amount. So I'm giving you guys a grand tour. Um, this is what that looks like. Again, so we're looking at Southern Louisiana here. And this is, uh, I think there's a new one that they just to produce, I don't have it. But um, so yellow here indicates, or excuse me, uh, hot colors here indicate loss. Red is stuff that was lost, that was, was already lost. This was produced just after 2000, this, this map. So it's a bit old, but it still serves the main point. So, so red is stuff that used to exist back in the day, and now it was, it was, it was land, was, you could walk on and, and, you know, with boots on. Now it's underwater. Yellow is the area that's projected over the next couple decades to continue to go away. Green, the greens, are the areas that have been added. So, so the additional wetlands. And uh, again, light green is the stuff that was already added. And then dark green is what we think will be added over the next coming decades. And it's a very hard pattern to figure out, but there's more red than there is green. So we're Swiss cheesing out that whole chunk, the whole southern chunk, the whole southern edge of Louisiana. So this is what that looks like. These are some of your, your colleagues on a previous trip. And this picture is right about, where is this picture? This picture is right about here. So we're standing on, we're, we're, I pulled a van over and the students got out and they're looking. And we're looking, uh, which way are we looking? I think we're looking here eastward. And so they're putting their water, their, their finger in the water. What we're seeing here is, is dead cypress, skeletons of a landscape that is gone now. Cypress are amazing trees, they're really, really killer. They're just physiologically awesome. They're, they're a, you know, imposing, uh, you know, a, a tall adult is an imposing presence on the landscape, they're really cool. They have all this crazy stuff. They have these things right here, these things called knees, cypress knees, which have these air, these, these uh, basically air spaces in them that, that we think helps, helps keep the roots aerated even when they're, when they're inundated and, and, and underwater and that they would normally go anoxic and, and just all kinds of crazy cool stuff. So these trees can be inundated, can, can be alive even if they're underwater for you know, a long period of time. But they are an angiosperm, they, they, are, they are a plant I should say. They're a plant, not an angiosperm, they're a plant. They can't live underwater, they're not seagrass, that's the only, that's the only thing we have lives underwater, it's a plant. So while they can take being underwater for a long time, they can't live 12 months underwater. So what happened here, this 
in interpreting this landscape, this was dry land. The little seed, you know, the cone dropped and the seed germinated and grew into a tree. And then the land eroded away. And for a little while, the tree, you know, hung out, hung out, hung out, and then eventually it drowned. So this is a drowned landscape. So all, almost all these cypresses, there's one or two that are still alive. The rest are all dead. And so this is literally the, the, the um, you know, erosion of life in this part of our country. And I don't know, I have the picture in there. Uh, we flew over it for the 10th anniversary <laughs> for the, some news crews. But um, I think I was supposed to link that to a video to show you guys, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll have to dig it up and show it to you. Okay, so what's going on? Why is this land going away? Because of choices you and I have made. So first and foremost, there's this thing called subsidence. Wetlands, new soil dumped on it, a lot of dead crud, a lot of dead plants. And so eventually those dead plants that, that are forming some of, the, some of the volume of that soil kind of rot away, if you will. And so, so on its own, the wetland so soil is slowly compacting or slowly getting more compressed, slowly subsiding or getting lower. Again, part of that is just natural. That's background that goes on every day of the week, every day of the year, every wetland that is in existence, etc. But you and I have sped up the process. So we, um, by su so it's just like having a Coke. So you guys have a Coke, stick a straw in. Don't use plastic straws. Okay, fine, use a paper <laughs> straw, stick a paper straw in there. You suck the soda and what happens? The water, le the, the, the Coke level in the glass goes down, right? So that's what we've done by doing massive. And by massive, I mean massive. A little bit water extraction, but mostly is oil and gas extraction across the entirety of this region. So we're sucking out stuff below the surface, and that's allowing the surface to go lower. Matt. All right, so my curiosity is like, so eventually it's just gonna retreat, right? Because the sea level's rising. I'm sorry, wait, a retreat, what do you mean? Like, all these wetlands are gonna retreat inland. Ah. Because everything's just gonna fill in. No. The sea level rises. No. So, 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 so if it was, a, if it was a, a naked landscape, you're right, the wetlands would just shift inland. But we've, we've put up barriers to that. So the analogy on our coast, we have PCH, yeah. right? We're not gonna let PCH go away. We're gonna wall PCH up. And so if we didn't have PCH, like at Ormond Beach here, uh, one of the reasons why we're doing the wetland restoration at Ormond Beach is, is we have space there. As, as the tide comes up, you're right, the wetland will essentially migrate inland, but we'll still have basically wetland, right? In areas where we have so-called coastal squeeze, where we either have cities or, or roads or some other structure, that doesn't allow the coastal ecosystem to move inland. And, and in a lot of Louisiana, that's what's gonna happen. Okay, so we have subsidence. Next, that's one thing going on. Number next, sea level rise. So separate from that, as, we're, as Matt just brought up, the sea level is going up. Now some of this, again, just like with subsidence, is just whether we were here or not, it would be going on. There's, there's been some dynamic level, you know, sea level has gone up and down in the past. So it's go, there's a bit of background rise, period, carriage return, new paragraph, but that's not what we're talking about. Humans, you and I, have emitted so much carbon and other things we are inducing the oceans to rise. And so that amount of anthropogenic driven sea level rise is much greater, much larger than that background. Okay, so again, if you get in a conversation with someone, oh, sea level's always been rising. Yes, thank you, period. But we're actually changing the rate and making it much, much faster than it otherwise would, would be going on it. And so, okay, so one, we have the subsidence. So one, the land is going down. At the same time, two, the water is coming up, right? The third thing here, we've levied the Mississippi River. So because of some craziness that happened in the 1920s, part of which is that song that I had you listen to, that Randy Newman song, right? Um, uh, people were dying because of some crazy flooding. 
in the 1920s? And so the answer was, what was the answer? Nature sucks, <laughs> right? That was literally the answer. We're humans, dude. We're powerful. We'll tell nature how to behave. And so it was the great era of the dam builders. It was the great era of the modern engineer, where we're so smart, we're gonna tell nature how to roll. And so in the context of the Mississippi, the idea was we're no longer gonna have quote unquote damaging, quote unquote debilitating, quote unquote destructive flooding. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that natural levying that we talked about that exists, and we're gonna throw that on steroids, right? We're gonna, we're gonna make it even higher. So we're gonna make the, the, the barriers to the flooding so much more greater. So we're gonna constrict the water into the river, the primary river channel. <clears throat> and so for flooding, I guess that's great. You don't get flooded. But then we don't get that seasonal deposition of flood that is what nourishes all this stuff. If we had that, all the subsidence and everything would more, more or less be taken care of. We'd be dumping sediment so water's going fast, 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 fast. Whoosh! Jumps out of the channel. As it jumps out of the channel, it slows down. As it slows down, it can't hold as much sediment. It drops stuff. And so it deposits more soil, more sediment on the Mississippi Delta. So that's basically starting since the 30s. And we've radically reduced, massively reduced the amount of sediment added into these wetland systems. And then lastly, or not almost, almost lastly, um, the, uh, these are all things that are going on all the time, pressures that are going on all the time. The last pressure that's going on all the time is nutria, which if you just saw the news articles in the last couple weeks, we apparently now have more nutria again in California. Awesome! So these are these kind of funky guys that look like that. They look like sort of a cross between a rat and a beaver kind of thing. Capybara. They're kind of like a capybara. Yeah, they're not as big as those guys. So these guys were brought in originally at, for uh, fur industry in this part of the country. And then the lore is that a <clears throat> hurricane came in <coughs> and broke open the farms and they went crazy. Nah, it probably wasn't what really happened. <clears throat> what really happened was people just couldn't, couldn't make a go of the, fur, uh, of, of, the, of the fur trade with them. So they basically kind of like, they escaped and they didn't care and they got loose. These guys are massive, massive, huge, voracious herbivores. So they get in and they eat a huge amount of plant roots, plant stems, uh, relative to their body weight every day. So they are little nucleating sources of little Swiss cheese, the start of a little Swiss cheesing of the wetland here. And it's going all over the place, little, little popcorn going everywhere. So nutria are also part of the situation. And the last thing is hurricanes. So these first four things are going on every day, you know, every night, every morning, every weekend, etc. Hurricanes are a pulsed stress. So hurricanes only come occasionally. But when they come, they, have, they can have huge impacts on wetlands and huge impacts on wetland loss. So what do we do with this? Okay. For subsidence, so okay, so the subsidence is being driven mostly by the petroleum industry extraction stuff. Uh, rising sea levels are pri is primarily driven by climate change, global warming. Uh, uh, levees are, are messing with the flow, etc. Nutria, if I didn't say they're from South America, they're not native to North America. And then the main response, the best thing we do is get more dirt, get more sediment on that coastal plain. That's what we need, Matt. All right, so. I understand, like, obviously, when you build a levee, it's preventing that sediment from, like, depositing on, like, yeah. the basin. So is that sediment just, like, traveling downstream and, like, in yes. kind of, like, a huge levee and outside the... Yes. Like, so to answer Matt's question, if that sediment isn't going on the land, where is it doing? It's going straight into the Gulf of Mexico, along with all the nutrients, and causing the low oxygen areas and causing the dead zone in the Gulf. So it's causing massive... Well, would that build up? Not, not in the, I mean, you know, I guess in a couple million years, but so the answer is no, because the levees would fail before, before I mean, we're talking, it's a lot. It's not like, you can be like, oh, 10 years. Like no. no, 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 deep, deep. So now not as deep as our California w yeah. waters, but you know, hundreds of feet deep, you know, many hundreds of feet deep or, or even thousands of feet deep. 
So Matt is asking about these little, these little orange, excuse me, these little green areas. This is in what's known as the Atchafalaya Basin. This is the area that is not levied. So this is the, nat what we're seeing there is a natural process, that, that deltaic so-called distributaries, that thing. So that's where the river wants to go because there's less hydrologic uh, 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 constraint and stuff like that. This stuff little right here is, is uh, so this is the levied part and then it stops being levied right about here. So this, you see that sort of stuff going on here. But, what, but it's going, it's getting such a, what can you imagine, a fire hose, like a fire hose here, right? Because it's being artificially um, uh, 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 concentrated. So the flow is higher than it otherwise would be. And so it's, yeah, some of it's being dropped here, but it's also, woo, rocketing straight off. Yeah. Whereas here, this is not levied. So here it's flowing at more natural rate. And so it's deposited in a more natural deltaic fan type shape. Uh, good question. No, because the whole Mississippi is levied all the way up into the middle of the country. Uh, so I know we're going, we're, we'll end the bit here, uh, but just want to finish this part before I uh, let you guys go for tonight. So, okay, so let's look at some examples of this. So um, here is uh, some wetland loss. This is Bastion Bay. And, and when I look at this, uh, what sticks out to me is this thing right here. I see these straight lines. Here's, uh, here's another area of the Mississippi. So here, this, this is the Mississippi. Here is a natural channel. Everybody got me? It's kind of curvy. It's kind of woo da boo da boo da boo da boo da Here's a boink, straight shot. Look at this thing. What the hell is that? That's people. What is this? This is an oil and gas extraction effort. What do they do? They got in a barge and they took the barge uh, down here, bargey, 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 right, right here. And they took an excavator. Well, I think, I don't know for sure, but, but if it's like most places, so they put basically a big excavator on this floating barge and it went and dug out in front of it. And then it turned a half turn and dumped that sediment to the side. And then it went back in the middle of the channel, dug out another scoop, dumped it on the right hand side and then slowly worked its way this way. Why? Because it's trying to get to a place where they want to put an oil uh, well or gas well head. Now this is two things. Uh, one, it makes a nice barge. So when they want to bring in supplies or lay pipe or something, it's a, they have a barge. But two, they've now dumped all the sediment and made dry, dry land, raised the, the area up. So now if they want to walk on it, drive a truck, do something like that, put a, put a generator, now they have a space to do that, right? So it makes total sense. It's logical why you would do that. Now what's supposed to happen by legal contract, when they're done with that, they're, they're required to come dig this up and put this back and, and, and restore the wetland. Yeah. We'll hear more on that later. But suffice it to say, they don't really do that. And I'm not trying to blame one person or two. This is an industry-wide issue in Louisiana. Would horizontal like drilling mitigate that though? A little bit, but uh, this is cheaper uh, than horizontal drilling. So does the line behind where they dug it dug the water no, no behind there? Here? No. Here? Just, yeah. No, 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 down here. Just, yeah. Just, <laughs> where? Right there, right there. The water inside the levee. Yeah. As soon as you can see that. So what, ha what happens when you build that thing up here to cut the rest of that off? And so this is the ocean here, yeah. and this is the Mississippi. Yeah, the levee between them. Like in the levee itself? Okay. So we'll see when we get there. We'll see when we get there. Okay, another, another example. Again, these straight line things. When you see this, this is humans messing with the landscape. Nature abhors a straight line unless we're talking about a crystal, right? So, so these straight things, even though it might look natural or when you look out the airplane window, it looks so kind of wetlandy, that's, a, that's a, the, the taint of human manipulation on the landscape. Okay, so let's talk about what Katrina did to wet, an example of what Katrina did for wetland loss. Okay, here's Louisiana. Let's look at the southern part. Here's that right there. I'm gonna talk about the Chandelier Islands. Dr. Patch. 
Loves Barrier Islands. Oh my yes. god. Great. Let's talk about that again. We don't have Barrier Islands. She's from the South. We're from the West Coast, most of us, right? Where we have a very steep up and down coast, very deep coast. We don't have Barrier Islands. They have Barrier Islands where it's shallow. So if we go to Point Magoo and we pick up a rock and we chuck it, right, as far as we can chuck it, it's going to go, I don't know, a couple hundred feet and it's going to bloop and it's going to go down to who the hell knows, 100 feet deep water, 200 feet deep water, right? Depends on where we throw it. If we go out here and do the same thing in Florida and Louisiana and we throw it, ooh, same distance, it plops, it goes what, like three feet, two feet, right? It's a very different um, geology, geography here. So the, barrier, so the barrier islands or sand islands only exist in these, shallow, these areas that have very shallow uh, shelves off of our coast. So here's what this looks like. So in this case, these are chandelier islands and off to the right is the oceanward facing side that's basically beach. And then look behind them, so they, they essentially act as a speed bump. We can imagine if we're a wetland, or wetland, I should sleep more. If we imagine if we're a, a hurricane coming from the right side of the image, going to the left, and we hit this, this is in effect a speed bump. So we have sand at the front, and then we have wetlands in the, in the lee of it, in the, in the, in the behind it, right? Okay. So let's take a look at this. So here's, here's an area that we zoomed in, and the, arrow, the yellow arrows show uh, places of reference. So this, this picture is from 2001, so obviously before Hurricane Katrina. Um, and uh, again, same thing, another, another area. And, and again, the arrows are for reference. So this is right after Hurricane Katrina. So things are just nuked, right? So. Hurricane Katrina, it, that one storm, you know, we're talking about wetland loss and we're losing, so the, the, the stat everybody throws out is a football field worth of wetland every 45 minutes, right? That's not exactly correct, but it's close enough. It gives you the idea. Hurricane Katrina, depends on how you want to measure it, but jumped us forward between 50 and 100 years in terms of wetland loss with that one storm. So again, these hurricanes, come in. Hurricanes are a natural part of the system, right? They've been going on forever, but we've so weakened the fabric of our wetlands by cutting off the sediment supply, screwing with all these other things. These wetlands come in and they just kind of rip stuff out. So all this stuff in red was lost due to wind shear. Came in and just sort of blew on the plants and the plants kind of ripped off and, and blew up into the into the air or, or piled up somewhere else in the marsh. Uh, my first trip back with, uh, with John um, after Katrina hit, what we went from well, with our friend that were uh, looking at parasitoids and, and these, these critters. So we went from, Louisiana, went from New Orleans, excuse me, to the Texas border. So we got to the Texas border, we went to a place called Holly Beach. The Holly Beach is also known as the Redneck Riviera. <laughs> so this is a place where folks that didn't have a lot of money, uh, you know, it's hot in this part of the country in the summertime, right? If, you're not, if you don't have a lot of money, you don't have air conditioning, it is hot. So this is a place where folks of more modest means, generally speaking, if they wanted a vacation place where they could go for sometimes or on the weekends or whatever with their family, this was a place they would go to. This wasn't a, a you know, massively wealthy place, but this is nevertheless a place to go. So we're, this is, this is a, a, a small town right on the, on the literal edge of the Gulf Coast, almost into Texas. This is what it looks like, this is what it looked like after, now we had Hurricane Katrina came up basically right along um, uh, uh, the, the eastern side and then shortly thereafter Hurricane Rita came in. Hurricane Rita went up more, more along the Texas border. Rita was actually more devastating ecologically for a variety of reasons, but, but, um, but it just went right over and it nuked this place. So this is LIDAR data. This is before and after, right? So all these green things were houses, right? So if we take the difference, all this stuff went down. This is what it looked like when I went there. So this was m super surreal. So we're looking at what used to be houses and for whatever, Dan can tell us why, but for whatever strange government policy, they had money to come in and fix the signs. 
So they went in and they sure as heck, they went in and put the stop signs back in. I cannot it's like, I don't know, there's some, there some federal money or state money to make sure the stop signs are up. So <laughs> stop signs went up. The fire extinguishers, or the fire extinguishers, the, the fire hydrants, excuse me, persisted. So th those weren't newly put in, those survived. But literally everything else was just simply swept out of existence. Knocked into the marsh. Cars, vehicles, whatever. Now again, this is not California. So right where I'm taking this picture, so if, I, if you look, there's our rental car in the, in the red, and then if you look in the distance, there's a truck, and then right behind the truck is the beach. So I'm standing at about, oh, I don't know, two feet above sea level here. Three feet above sea level, maybe, right? It's, it's not like here in California, we have a six foot tide. It's not like that. It's, it's a much more mellow tidal range, and so, and, and there's, there's nowhere to go. When the, when the sea rises, when the, when the winds come up, there's, there's, there literally is nowhere to go. And so this is the landscape that we're talking about, right? This is absolutely screwed for, for folks that live here. But we're a wealthy country. The same exact process is going on all around the world. And in Bangladesh and in Southeast Asia, they don't have the resources, that, even though they might have come late, they don't have the resources we have. So in dealing with these problems, this is truly a global challenge that we're facing. And it is not some kind of tree hugger baloney thing, right? This is a human right thing. This is an environmental justice thing. This is how we're going to deal with this as adults, this major, major threat. This is not a political thing. This is the reality that's coming down the train, uh, coming down the tracks. And I would suggest to you that one of the values of what you're going to learn in New Orleans and, Kat and about Katrina and all this stuff uh, regardless as to whether the specific storm of Hurricane Katrina was quote unquote caused by climate change or caused by global warming, it most very likely was made worse by climate change, at least, that's not the point. The point, this is absolutely a window into the future. This is how our coastal systems are going to experience sea level rise. It's probably not going to be oink, 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 oink. Boink, and then one year, 50 years, or one day, 50 years from now, get your feet get wet. It's going to happen in these catastrophic events, most likely. Most likely during wintertime storms or hurricanes or something like that. And this is, this is a window into our future. Um, a couple more slides and we'll stop for the night. You guys are getting burned out, I can tell. But, but uh, we'll pick it up next time. But so this is, uh, also remember, in terms of context, we're almost done with our context here. This is... Absolutely, even though we're gonna be in the swamp and you're looking around, this is cool and what this is crazy. This is absolutely a human dominated ecosystem. So, um, uh, on the left, on this, this lower graph right here, this is the population of Jefferson Parish, right? Used to be not that many people, a lot more people now. Uh, this one on the left, that's some of our oil and gas. Some of, this is only the main. You'll freak out when I show you the real oil and gas wellheads. But that's just some of the pipelines, right? Moving oil from offshore onto shore. Uh, over there is... is that's our, the blue, that's a pipeline grid? Yep, yep, yep. But you'll really freak out when I show you the, the, the wellheads. This, this is just the major pipelines, right? And, and people and all that kind of crazy stuff. Again, New Orleans is now, in effect, a bowl. So here's, here's let's call this New Orleans. And here's a cross section to just reiterate that. So here we go. Here's Lake Pontchartrain. So, so here's Lake Pontchartrain up here, dark blue, dark blue. Here is the Mississippi River, light blue, light blue. This, and this is a little bit exact. It's compressed, so it's a little bit exaggerated side to side. But but the relative difference is correct. So this is so this is a transect I've done from A to B, right from Pontchartrain to the Mississippi River, and that's what we're showing here. So again, Mississippi River higher than sea level, and parts of uh, New Orleans are low. This is an exaggerated part, but still, parts of New Orleans are lower than uh, sea level. Again, not not unusual. This is not going to play. Oh, there we go. Okay, so this, this is an animation. So we're going one meter. I just stop it. Two meters of rise, three meters of water, four meters, and pretty much everything's underwater within about you know 15 feet of sea level rise, right? It's not like California. We our campus here is about 18 feet above sea level. 
for, for comparison for us here. So, you know, some sea level, not that we're going to get nine meters of sea level rise tomorrow, but the point is it's a very, very flat landscape. Okay, so that, that, that's our context for understanding what happened with Katrina. So next time we pick it up, we'll talk about what the storm exactly did and then the human impacts that it had and the initial impacts after the storm.